Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this second edition of Virtual Creative Mornings Munich. My name is Katja Giri. I am the host of Creative Mornings Munich, and I couldn't be more excited to see so many of you joined today. For those of you who are new to Creative Mornings, I will just say a few words about Creative Mornings as such. Uh, before we invite Kimo, our amazing speaker, who is going to be joining us from a very special location today to share with us uh, some thoughts on the topic of nature. So when it comes to Creative Mornings, let me just say that Creative Mornings is currently present in over 200 chapters and the concept is super cool and pretty easy. It is meeting the local creative community once a month with uh, some free breakfast and coffee. This time it's virtual, so I hope that you got yourself some coffee and around an inspiring talk that gathers around a certain theme that is joining all different uh, international chapters into this one monthly theme. Our events are and will always be free, so I'm super happy to see you in the virtual edition, but hopefully uh, at some point soon as well, uh, we will be able to have some coffee together in person. I would like to say first big thanks to our global sponsors, without whom uh, Creative Mornings wouldn't be possible. First of all, MailChimp for marketing. And you know, at times when things are far from business as usual, Paul Jarvis has actually teamed up with MailChimp and he's sharing his thoughtful conversations with small business owners and entrepreneurs, negotiating new economic uh, realities from uh, this uh, um, special Corona pandemic. Then I would like to say a big thanks to WordPress for web publishing and would like to let you know that uh, WordPress is currently offering free 30 minute webinars every day for anyone who is interested in learning more about how to build a web page or how to bring their businesses online. So this is also something that we will share here in the chat as well as later on uh, through our newsletter. And then last but not least, Basecamp, our global sponsor as well, which is an amazing tool for project management. And what it would be more important to master right now than managing uh, different projects, especially when we're working from home. So this is definitely something that you can also have a look at. Now, I would like to say huge thanks as well to our local sponsors, namely Spinning Wheel and Riva Photography for making this session possible, for bringing it to, to uh, the video format and making sure that we can all enjoy it, as well as to Javi Design, who is our local sponsor. I would also like to say big thanks to Velvet Space, a beautiful co-working space in the heart of Munich, who are hosting us for the live Q&A session today. Now, I'm very excited to announce the monthly theme, which is nature. And we couldn't have a better speaker today than Dr. Kimo Quintens. So without further ado, Kimo, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for uh, being so creative when it comes to your talk. And the stage is yours. We're living in a time of unprecedented change and disruption. Everything we knew about the way that the social and economic world was organized is being turned totally upside down. We're in the middle of a fundamental reorganizing experience. The only way that we're going to come through this, that we're going to solve the problems that we're facing right now, is with an enormous amount of creativity, an enormous amount of new problem solving, enormous amount of resilience, and we're going to have to work together. We're going to have to collaborate in new ways. But if you're anything like me right now, you're not really in a state of mind to do that very well. You're very distracted. You're looking at your mobile devices all day long. You're feeling this stress and this pressure that's crushing that creativity. It's squeezing out your ability to collaborate well with other people. So why are we here? I'm going to show you today why and how forests are particularly powerful for solving exactly these kinds of problems, for opening up our collaborative ability, for opening up our ability to connect to other people, 
to break old, established, and destructive mental habits, and also to give us enormous health benefits, to reduce our stress, to reduce all of the chronic problems that we have from repressed immune functions. Forests are incredibly powerful healers and incredibly powerful creative resources. Now to understand what's happening and to understand how we get out of the situation, we first have to understand something really important about the way our bodies respond to stress. Now, most of us learned a model of stress when we were young that it's kind of like a seesaw, that, that either we're in this fight or flight response, we're under stress and we're really active and alert, or we're in rest and digest, we're calm, we're coming down, we're just going at ease. And this is what drives a lot of the thinking behind having work and play be opposites, that somehow those two don't fit together. We think often that if we're working, working is stressful, and so that's where we're most alert and most productive. And then if we're resting and relaxing, that's unproductive time. That's a completely false model of how our bodies respond to stress, and it actually gets us into a lot of problems. So, What's the better way to think about how our bodies respond? About 25 years ago, a professor named Stephen Porges at the University of Illinois at Chicago, he's the head of the Brain Body Center there, he developed a theory of how our nervous system evolved over time. And what he argues is that actually we have a three-level hierarchy of how we respond to threats, and those correspond to how our nervous systems evolved over time. The most basic level, the earliest part of our nervous system to evolve, involves the part of our vagus nerve that comes down off the brain and controls our organs and our, our, our viscera. And this system is designed under extreme threat to completely shut down. This is this experience of shutting down and disassociating, of making ourselves small and immobile so that a threat passes us by. This is actually a really important survival mechanism in extreme dangerous situations. This is part of what allowed our species to survive over many millions of years. The next part of the, the human nervous system that evolved evolved when we were in this lizard phase of evolution. And it's the, the nerves and muscles that come off of the spine into the extremities. This is the sympathetic nervous system, and this controls our fight and flight response. This is what gets us to punch forward when there's danger to attack things that are gonna be a danger to us, or to, to flee, to really move and use our bodies to escape from danger. This is a classic stress response. Our bodies are alert, they're, they're action-oriented, okay? But the third level of our nervous system that evolved when we were mammals is actually totally different, and it's very, very powerful when we talk about creativity and collaboration. That is, the third part of our bodies to evolve is something called the social engagement system. It evolved when we became mammals. These are all of the muscles and nerves that control the parts of us that express ideas, emotions, that communicate, the muscles of the throat, of the face and the facial expressions, of our, our ears. This system only kicks in when we feel safe in our environment, and it, it widens the bandwidth that we're able to communicate and collaborate and understand other people. It's the foundation of creativity in groups. It's the foundation of trust in groups. It's really the foundation of all our most human superpowers. So there's nothing wrong with any of the states. One of these states is not better than the other. The most important thing is that we don't get stuck in a state that's inappropriate to the situation that we're in. That is, it doesn't serve us at all to be happy and friendly if there's a real danger coming at us but it also doesn't serve us to be activated and ready to fight or defend ourselves if we're actually safe. And this is where most people are in stressful workplaces right now. They're alert, they're looking for danger, they're anticipating problems when actually what's happening around them is they're quite safe. So how does this have an impact on our ability to collaborate? There are lots of ways, but I'll give you one really powerful example. 
when your stress system, your sympathetic nervous system is activated into this heightened fight or flight mode, one of the first changes that happens is to the muscles of your ear, that actually your ears start tuning into sounds of potential predators, that is low frequency sounds, or high pitch sounds, sounds of someone in danger, sounds of someone screaming. And that middle range, that range of normal human communication gets kind of tuned out. So it's really common when you go to business meetings that people will say that they talked and talked and no one really heard each other. And if people are coming into those meetings stressed out, it is quite literally hard for them to hear each other. So do you feel like this often? Do you feel like this at work? Or do you notice the people that you work with are in a stress response looking for danger when there isn't any danger around? How can we come out of this? How can we open up all those parts of ourselves, the real bandwidth of our communication and collaboration? And what does that have to do with forests? When was the last time that you were in a forest? And how do you feel when you are in a forest? Do you feel relaxed? Do you feel grounded? Do you feel energized? Have you ever asked yourself why? Why does the forest have a certain effect on you? So about 30 years ago, the Japanese government started sponsoring research into the impact of forests on human health. Japan is in a unique situation where they have some of the highest population density in the world, but they also have some of the highest level of forest cover in the entire industrialized world. Nearly 70% of all of Japan is covered in forest. So Japanese universities started researching how they could bring together people and forest to help solve some of the epidemics of chronic stress diseases and chronic stress pressures that people were feeling in cities. So these university researchers took thousands of people over a number of years and they would expose them through certain activities like walking and sitting quietly and they compared the same people in a forest environment and in a city environment. And they wanted to see were there any physiological or psychological differences between those two environments. The people who spent time in the forest experienced lower blood pressure and heart rate after just 15 minutes in the forest. They had a reduction in blood pressure after one day in the forest that lasted for five days afterwards. There was an improvement of weakened immunity with an increase in the count of natural killer cells which are known to fight tumors and infections. There was a reduction in stress hormones, had lower levels of anxiety and confusion. Those people experienced higher quality sleep. They also experienced increased creativity. But why? Why do forests have that kind of effect? Okay, a big part of the answer comes from the actual trees and plants themselves. So many trees and many plants exude a certain type of chemical from their essential oils called phytoncides. Now phytoncides are really like the plant's immune system. They are what protect trees and plants from disease, from bacteria, from fungus. Those phytoncides are inhaled by humans and they have a very powerful effect on reducing blood pressure, on reducing stress level, that is reducing the sympathetic activation of our nervous system. They have a really important quality of improving sleep and they also increase uh, concentration and creativity. A second important reason that forests have this powerful effect on us is that we are naturally designed to synchronize with our environment and synchronize with the people who are around us. It's one of the reasons that we're able to collaborate is because we're able to first coordinate. We set our internal rhythms with what's happening around us. It's a very important survival mechanism. But when we're in dense, busy, crowded cities, all of that works against us. We start going into higher and higher pace, matching the pace of all of this movement around us. And that increases stress and brings it to a chronic level. When we come back into the natural environment, we're coming back into an environment where we had almost all of our evolutionary history. And we start to synchronize ourselves with natural rhythms. We start to synchronize ourselves 
with the rhythms of wind blowing through the trees, with the movements of animals, with the movement of water. This is a much slower, quieter pace that brings our stress down and increases our capacity to connect to each other. And the third really important reason is that forests have a very powerful effect on something called perceptual gating. So perceptual gating is our ability to either expand the amount of information we're perceiving or limit the amount of information we're perceiving. Now that's very important when we need to adapt to new circumstances. When we're going through rhythms and patterns and our environment is not changing, it's really useful to limit the amount of new information that comes in. It's important to just be in habits and routines. But when our environments change and we need to start sensing what's going on, it's very important that our perceptions widen and open up. So how can we actually do this when we go out into a forest? I'm going to show you three very simple methods that you can do immediately after this talk. You can go out and try these yourself. They're easy and I think you're going to like them. So one of the really simple methods that I want to show you is just changing the direction of your movement. All I'm going to be doing is walking backwards. So you want to find a space where you kind of see behind you that, that you're, it's clear you're not going to run into anything. And then you're going to take some time, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, whatever you want to do, and just slowly walk backwards. Now really be careful. You want to sort of tune in to what's happening underfoot. And remember that the whole purpose of this activity is to shift a perceptual pattern. It's so easy when we're walking forward to be distracted and to be thinking about our emails and our work and what's coming next. As soon as I start walking backwards, I can't do anything other than focus on the present. And even more powerfully, everything that's happening in my perceptual sphere is the reverse of the way it normally is. So instead of seeing everything that's coming into my view, everything that's happening around me is sort of a new surprise. Every leaf, every tree is jumping in at me. And this brings me very much into the present. This will do something very interesting to your perceptions and to your focus. It's something that can be a really wonderful relaxing experience and a great creative booster. So for this next activity, all you're going to be doing is lying down. Now you can do this directly on the forest floor if it's comfortable, or if you prefer, you could be in a hammock. These are inexpensive hammocks that you can buy and they're wonderful ways to relax and enjoy the forest. Now, when you lay down, it's like we're going into a, a type of uh, relaxation meditation, but really what's happening is this perceptual shift is taking us out of our normal patterns. Invite yourself to just let go. You don't have anything to do and start to tune into the different things you normally don't actually watch. Tune into the movement, the movement of the trees, of birds, of clouds. Start to tune into what's going around you in more and more detail. This is a beautiful way to let go of a pattern of thinking and let that relaxation of being in the forest and the perceptual shift that happens in the forest go even deeper into your experience. Another activity we can do plays with our perceptions and allows us to tune into things that we are otherwise normally ignoring. And for this, uh, it's very helpful if you have like a little blindfold or a sleep mask, because all you're going to do is put this blindfold on and then tune into your other senses. Let your other senses amplify. So when you put the blindfold on, now you want to spend some time, really take 10 or 15 minutes to start to explore what's happening in your other senses. As the visual sense goes out and isn't so dominant, what do you notice? How many of these amazing bird sounds can you hear? 
What other sounds can you hear happening in the forest? What are you smelling that you weren't noticing before? When you breathe in, what are you tasting? What's the taste in the air that you didn't notice before? And when you're ready, if you are in a safe place, start to explore with your hands. It's great to do this with a tree and just feel what is going on in your other senses that you're not normally noticing. And remember, the whole purpose here is that we're breaking up our perceptual patterns. Those healing qualities of the forest, they're happening by just being in here. We're amplifying something else, something that's accessing this root of creativity, this root of really deep relaxation that's going to amplify our ability to connect to other people. Do you remember what it was like when you were a child in the forest? Do you remember how everything was fresh, everything was new, everything was interesting? Do you remember how you felt free to play and to run around and you didn't worry about making mistakes? I'd like to give you that feeling again. This next activity is something really special. We're going to go deep into this opening up of our perceptual gates using a particular type of uh, mental trick that brings us back to our perceptual world when we were quite young. So we're just going to do a very simple but very powerful visualization. So I'd invite you to close your eyes and really let yourself absorb the sounds of the forest. Remember what the forest looks like around you. And then you see in your mind's eye a child walking towards you. And this is the four or five year old version of yourself. And so see yourself as a child walking towards you through the forest and they walk right up in front of you. And then you're standing, looking down and they're looking up at you and really spend some time to look at yourself. What did you look like when you were that age? What did you feel like when you were in the forest. And then you want to ask this young version of yourself if they'll help you, if they'll help guide you through the forest. And when they say yes, then slowly they turn around and you notice that their body is hollow It's like a mask. And you're going to lift that young version of yourself up and put it literally like a mask onto yourself, onto your face. And really take the time, get the eyes matched up and the nose and the mouth and the ears matched up. Get every part of that face and all those senses really perfectly matched up. And then when you're ready, open your eyes and just explore and play. Now, when I've done this before, 
with other people. Uh, one of the things that's always amazing is that, that I've always seen that there's somebody usually quite serious in the group and the moment that that person opens their eyes, they usually just pew, they just run off into the forest and start playing. They're climbing trees, they're playing on things. Like this is a very powerful type of psychological rediscovery. It is a way of tricking your mind into opening those senses up and playing with a memory that's very deeply buried in you of what it was like to be in that environment. This is a powerful way to disrupt the patterns that you normally have, to access a type of creativity, a willingness to play, a willingness to explore, and an ability to see more things than you normally do. It is wonderful, and I highly recommend that you try it out. So coming out to the forest is a powerful catalyst to improve our health, our mental well-being, and to boost our creativity. Time spent here is going to bring your heart rate down. It's going to bring your blood pressure down. It's going to reduce your anxiety. It's going to improve your sleep. It's going to improve your creativity. It's going to help you stop spending time on non-existent threats and really be present so that you can fully activate your social engagement system and amplify the power of connecting to other people to amplify the power of being able to trust other people, to come up with new creative solutions to the problems that you have. It's gonna help you break negative mental patterns that are limiting your creativity and limiting your resilience. This is the environment where we spent 99.99% of our time as a species. This is the environment that we know well. This is the environment that has taken care of us and supported us through so many enormous changes. And now, as we go deep into another very important historical change, this is the environment that can help reconnect us to the most powerful human qualities that we have to adapt to be agile, to be creative, to be resilient. So please do yourself a favor, come out and enjoy those gifts that are already inside of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that time in the forest and I am very happy to answer any questions now. Okay, so I see a couple questions here. Uh, the first one from, from Marco. Marco is asking what would be good alternatives if there's no forest to go to? Um, that's a great question actually and one of the, one, when you look at the research that was done uh, in Japan on this uh, nature therapy, one of the first things that they actually researched were the therapeutic effects of actually handling and touching untreated wood. And they found that, that just holding and smelling wood has a very similar positive effect, especially when you talk about that calming effect, that de-stressing effect. Um, the important caveat was that the wood has to be a wood that smells good to the person who's being tested. Uh, but they've also found similar, uh, similar effects uh, with people who are uh, working with plants at home, um, or you can also do some similar techniques just in a park. It doesn't need to be completely surrounded by trees. The really important thing for coming out of stress and bringing yourself into that activation of your social engagement really is about relaxation and that can happen and is, is really powered by any deep contact with a natural item, wood, plants. Trees are great, um, but it doesn't have to be in a forest. So next, oh, I've got some more comments here. Uh, Katya asks, uh, what challenges have you been experiencing when you started out with this approach to reconnect to yourself? 
Um, I think I think for me a lot of the challenges are, are kind of similar to uh, to the challenges that most people would face when they're meditating. You know, breaking out of your perceptual patterns is not just an immediate thing. There's a reason that you've established these patterns, and so getting into a state of mind where I can let go of all of my future thinking, I can let go of ruminating on the past. I, it's just as challenging in in a forest as it is meditating. Um, so, so the, the added thing about forests as well is, is there's, there's a part of, at least for me, my rational mind, which is kind of like clinging on to what it knows and going out into the forest and doing some of these methods, it really means embracing an unknown. It means embracing uh, a kind of a force that, um, has its own unique power that doesn't really appeal to the rational mind. And so letting go of that sense that you're doing something strange or letting go of that sense, that, that kind of internal resistance which comes up in different ways um, has its own challenges. But, but I think like you, a lot of people experience in meditation, th there's a reason that those challenges are coming up. It's kind of a compass that, that points you towards an area of your life where there's something to relax, there's something to let go into. So um, the challenges are, 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 are positive ones, I think. Oh, uh, lots more questions here. I don't know what... Oh, Creative Mornings here. Three questions right now. Um, okay, I really want to add nature in my routine. Can I ask what's my routine? Uh, that's from Maria. So, Maria, um, I, I don't know even that I have, like, a routine as much. I, I'd like to, as much as possible, uh, get out and take even a short walk. I, I'm lucky. I live near a park that has some really beautiful trees. So as often as I can, getting out and taking even a short, like a five minute walk first thing in the morning um, is great for me. I, I use a, another technique that I, didn't, that I didn't talk about here where um, you're going through and just taking a short walk and, and letting go of the labels that you have for things. So imagining you're like the first person on earth or imagining you're, you're, you're a god and you're, you're naming everything for the first time. And so just walking through the forest and, and letting go of all of the, the preconceptions you have and just sort of pinning out things and giving them names, really basic names, like tree, leaf. It, it's another wonderful way to, to just sort of step into the present and let that nature draw your senses in and let your senses expand. Um, as often as I can, I like to do a longer session uh, walking in the woods and so I'll often go out, I have a young son who is a year old, and, and I notice the similar effect for him. Every time we go for a walk, the same thing happens every time. As soon as we get into the forest, he looks around, he like gets animated, he starts kind of like talking to the trees, and then within a couple minutes, his whole body relaxes. Like if I'm carrying him, I feel him physically just start to relax much deeper than, than he would you know, in my apartment. So. Anything that you can do uh, to, to bring yourself out and build a routine is great. Personally, I also really love to get out with other people. Doing this together with other people is especially powerful. So, so I strongly recommend if you, if you want to do that, um, find other people to do it with. Okay, Kelty, uh, hi Kelty. Kelty asks, um, how does a forest compare to other kinds of natural environments, being on the ocean, a wide open field, etc.? The, the research that I've seen really only focused on forests, so I can't, I can't say, I can't give you from like a scientific perspective a comparison between natural environments. Um, I would expect that, that being in other natural environments, like being in the ocean or, or wide open space, would have a lot of other powerful relaxing effects, and you could do um, any of the same kind of perceptual uh, uh, activities to, to widen your senses in the natural environment. Forests happen to be particularly powerful um, specifically because of the things that I was talking about, about the, the phyton sides, for example, the, the, the healing effect of natural oils, the way that that environment is set up um, seems to have a very particularly powerful effect. So, like I'd said in the research, they'd done these comparisons of people who were trying to relax in, say, like a city park 
even though it was like close to a street where there would be lots of people and people going into a forest and, and the same people doing the activity in a forest had a much stronger physical and psychological effect. Okay. Um, how long have I been practicing nature therapy? Uh, are there any resources online or books you'd recommend? That's a question from uh, Yoneta. Uh, I have been practicing, well, you know, in some way you could say I've been practicing this my whole life it, it, because I was um, raised in Colorado, literally in a house in the forest. And, and I always had that love of going outside and I always had that sense of kind of, without knowing it as a child, of being grounded and being open to the environment. And, and I had to really rediscover that when I was older. I rediscovered that um, through a couple of experiences that, that brought me in really close contact with nature and, and almost like reawokened what I, what I intuitively knew um, when I was young. And I think that's interesting because it mirrors, say, what the Japanese research was finding is that they, they were talking about looking at forests because intuitively many people understood that it has this power and so they wanted to go from an intuitive understanding to an experimental uh, science to actually uh, a proven method for, for, for therapeutic uh, interventions. Um, there's some books, I'll post, I'll post up a couple links to uh, uh, resources that you'd find really useful. There's a great book by one of the Japanese researchers who was the first one to do the look at wood therapy and forest therapy. It's a book on Shinrin-yoku, this, this art of Japanese forest bathing. Um, there's a couple others that have been written by, by um, English speaking writers. There's a couple of books by some German authors that are fantastic. So. Uh, later, I will post some, some links to, uh, to resources for, for everyone here. Um, but if you want to, in the meantime, look up uh, books on forest bathing or Shinrin-yoku, and uh, there's some great things there. Let me see what else we've got here. Um, okay, moving from, so this is Reda, moving from France to Germany. Notice that here people are much more nature and, nature and hiking lovers. Are there any wisdom spiritual roots to that? Uh, I, I, think, I think when you go to basically any culture that, that has, um, that's had like a strong connection to nature in the past, you're, you're gonna find interesting roots to that in, a, in spiritual traditions, in kind of intuitive medicine traditions, in intuitive healing traditions. Um, Germany, I think there's a lot to be said on it. I'm not an expert on this, but I think there's a lot to be said about this kind of traditional German connection to nature, this, this you know, very German romantic notion of, of nature and the ability to get closer to something that's perfect. And um, so I, I wouldn't be able to compare it, say, to, to other European countries, but it seems to me, especially living in Munich and being in Bavaria, that there is this deep cultural intuitive knowledge about this power that you find as soon as you get into any of these forest communities. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, Eleonora says, I, I'm sur if I'm surrounded by nature, is it, is it enough for this relaxation process or is the walking part crucial? And what if I can just walk without the possibility to be surrounded by nature? Uh, yeah, I showed some techniques that were, that were fairly active, you know, that were moving in different ways because I wanted to highlight um, that, that, per, that specific method of like perceptual gating, of widening perceptions. But there's no need to move at all. Actually, if you look at um, the Japanese Shinrin-yoku practices, they have their parks all over Japan that have trails that are specifically designed for this with recommended activities, as sort of forest bathing trails. Uh, lots of the activities are simply sitting and looking. They're sitting quietly and meditating. They're laying down, doing nothing. Um, so so there's, there's all kinds of different ways that you can do this. You don't have to be moving. You don't have to be active. Um, I just wanted to show things that might be 
maybe new to some of the people who would be otherwise uh, familiar with, with things like sitting meditation. Um, and, and can you do it without being in nature? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's clear that there's big positive benefits from doing things like, like sitting meditation in any environment. What I think is personally interesting is that powerful connection of the, the, the physical and psychological impacts, the demonstrated physical and psychological impacts of being in forests with the demonstrated physical and psychological benefits of things like meditative practices. And when you put them together, you, you amplify the power of both of them. Uh, let's see here. What else we have? Pinned. Okay. Are there any other questions in here? Books about uh, suggestions for building resilience. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's actually a really interesting body of knowledge. Sorry, this is uh, uh, from Kaya. Um, the idea of resilience. There, there's, there's kind of a growing literature on, on uh, what resilience means for humans. But there's also this really wonderful, interesting literature on what resilience means for natural environments. So one of the areas that I found super interesting, that I found really powerful, is the, the literature on permaculture. So permaculture is a, is a style, of, of, um, style of growing or, or uh, 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 agriculture that's based on, on permanently sustainable practices. And a lot of what they're looking at is what makes natural environments naturally resilient. And, and I think for me personally, I found so many insights from studying how natural systems sustain themselves and what human communities particularly can do to sustain themselves and become more resilient. So all kinds of things that they're discovering about, you know, natural systems, if you leave them alone, they will maintain themselves indefinitely. Human agricultural systems, especially monocultural systems, if you leave them alone for any period of time, they degenerate, they fall apart. So what is it about stable, resilient, natural systems that allows them to continue? And, and so much of it comes down to the interactive diversity between elements where the different functions of the elements and the way they hold together really support each other and generate resources that cross boundaries to each other. And, Places where environments rub up together, creating all kinds of opportunities for new things to flourish, new things to generate value for the environment. And I think there's, there's beautiful parallels between those natural systems and the human system. So I'll share a couple of resources later in the chat on, on that literature. Um, are there any other questions? I'm just scanning through here. I don't see any other questions unless I'm, unless I'm missing something here. Oh, uh, okay, so Bernadette says, towards the end of the forest experience, you mentioned that we stay in this environment for, oh, um, sorry, when I, when I said we, we, we stay in this environment 99.9% .9 of our lives, I didn't mean our our current lives. What I was talking about was I was talking about human evolutionary history. So for human evolutionary history, the, the experience of living in these dense, unnatural environments is such a tiny, tiny fraction of, of our overall evolutionary experience. And, and so when you look at what has, has, has sort of built us over time, the, 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 the kinds of environments we're naturally adapted to, spending this enormous amount of time in natural environments means that we are, we are kind of pre-designed to, to engage with those environments, to learn from those environments, and to benefit from those environments. So for me, one of the most powerful comparisons is, is when I think about what is it, what is it like to be in an office environment versus what it's like to be in a forest environment. And especially if you're in a forest environment for any length of time, 
If you're in an office environment where you have four square walls, the temperature is controlled, having your environment be unchanging and be totally predictable, yeah, it may be comforting, but it has, it has like a dulling effect on your senses. It has a dulling effect on, your, uh, on, on all kinds of parts of your perception and your thinking. When you're in a natural environment, especially for any length of time, because that natural environment is changing constantly, the weather is changing, the temperature is changing, you're constantly having all parts of your body and your senses be woken up. You need to be alert to what's happening. And if you had to survive in that environment, you would have to do so much thinking about where things are in space, how patterns change. You would constantly be kind of shaken up by the need to be deeply perceiving your environment. And that need would be constantly pulling you into the present. And, and I think when we talk about all of the, the things that are happening with meditative practices in the West right now, I think a lot of it is just a response to the fact that being in unnatural, totally controlled, predictable environments all the time amplifies the, the tendency for us to step out of the present, for us to start ruminating on the past, for us to start you know, focusing on the future, and that, that, that all of those things together have a detrimental effect for our mental health. Okay. I don't see any other questions, so, unless anyone has any other questions, Okay, so many, many thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, back to Katya, and I will be very, very happy to answer any questions that I see come up on the thread, uh, to share resources, and, and feel free at any time, connect to me, reach out to me. Um, I will lead forest walks occasionally uh, around Munich, and I'd be very happy for anybody to join me. So thank you, thank you for coming today. Wow, thank you so much, Kima, for, for your talk. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, Kima, you truly transported us to a whole nother world, to a whole nother theme, and thank you so much for inspiring us. Uh, seeing all the questions, it seems that uh, your talk has definitely resonated with people. So uh, thank you for bring it, bringing it to, to our creative community. Now, if you haven't subscribed to our newsletter yet, uh, I'm highly encouraging you to do so, so that you stay tuned with all our upcoming uh, events, as well as all the different promotion codes that we have uh, mentioned at the very beginning from our global partners. So otherwise, I would be really wishing you a beautiful morning and uh, an exciting weekend. Have, uh, have fun and stay healthy, stay safe, and hopefully see you in a month. Bye, guys.